we cannot achieve the life that we're meant to achieve, which is meant to be a life with joy, with happiness, with peace, unless there is an intensity of work that goes into our soul. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry. Yay! So I think we're both inspired by a recent article in the New York Times by journalist Jessica Gross, and she brings up the concept of doing the work that's gaining popularity among young adults. We're not talking about career or vacation. We're not talking about scholarship or academia. The work is self-work as in self-improvement to become the self-actualized being. And she goes to a lot of different places in the article, but I think at the crux of what really bothered her is that it implies that that it can come off as being patronizing. That the reason people haven't been, their problems haven't been solved is because somebody isn't working hard enough, right? Um, she also references a trend on TikTok. And I think that's how she came to write this article. She kept having these different things, like 20 different messages pop up in her feed about doing the work and whatever that looked like to this different group of, I guess, young adults, as she puts it. And um, it wasn't clear what the work really is, right? And that's when my ears perked up. But she asked this question, does tending to my mind and soul have to be framed as yet another job, another box to check, another task to optimize and conquer? My gut reaction is I simply decline to do more work. My life is already filled with many kinds of labor, which gave me a little chuckle. I hear that a lot with couples I work with. They feel like they already have to work hard enough in life and they don't want the relationships to be more work. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting topic for today. And I do hear you, Jessica, but I do obviously think that there is, um, this is an important thing to have on your to-do list. It's well, essential. I, and I don't think, by the way, this is unique to Jessica. I think a lot of people feel like, you know, I'll do that when I have time, if I have time. And what is that? What is hard work? Well, I, I would actually say more emphatically that, and I... In the article, she was referring both to soul work and uh, work with the therapist. But I would say... The self-help versus spirituality is kind of how I read it. Right. But, but my point is that if not for making our spiritual work, our soul work a priority, all the other parts of our lives will not be as they should be. And I think the example you gave where you encounter couples where they're like, oh no, one more thing that I have to spend effort and work on. But the reality is that most, many of those couples, if they don't do that work and they wind up either divorcing or continuing in a, in a, in a not positive marriage, then the effect of that is that their entire life becomes much more difficult. So what I would say is it that unless... It affects everything else. Affects I think everything. a lot of people say, I don't have time to put energy into this, or maybe I can't even afford therapy, let's say, because I'm busy worrying about how to pay the bills or the more urgent pressing needs of how I'm going to get through this job I hate or whatever it may be. And what we're both saying, I think, is that the only way through the hardest parts of life is really with spirituality. Exactly. Again, more than that, and this is, I think, something that I'd like to really underscore in, in, in this podcast is that we cannot achieve the life that we're meant to achieve, which is meant to be a life with joy, with happiness, with peace, unless there is an intensity of work that goes into our soul work. Um, the, the danger of, you know, again, these are just names, so they can mean anything to anybody, but of, of, of you know, what some people call self-help, it's just that, oh, I have this one issue that I want to deal with, um, and so let me read a book about it, or let me do something about it right now. It's acute for whatever reason in the moment. But there isn't an ongoing, an ongoing effort or consistent ongoing effort um, of this important internal work. And, and I would say very strongly that unless that internal work is consistent and ever present and really the number one foundation of our lives, all the other parts of our lives suffer. The work, 
meaning the regular work that we do, our relationships suffer, our relationship with ourselves suffers. Well, I think that um, it can't be this one size fits all approach either. I think many people, like you said, it could be, oh, I have this one thing that I want to get around. And so you pick up a book. It becomes more of like a fad that you do for six months until you forget about it. And then you're on to the next thing. And um, obviously it doesn't work that way. Um, so I want to give a few examples of what the work is so we can really define what it is or isn't. And of course, again, it doesn't, it's not the same for everybody, but for some, the work is eating well, exercising, having a morning routine, learning something new, taking time to get pampered, manicure, pedicure, golf, massage, whatever. For others, the work is almost exclusively about self-care, meditating, journaling, going to therapy. And then of course, the approach to self-care or self-interest, um, when it's introspective, might look like this, advocating for yourself, setting healthy boundaries, loving and accepting yourself, reframing negative self-talk, finding mentors, reconnecting with your inner child, letting go of parts of yourself that don't serve you, reframing false beliefs, getting outside of your comfort zone and confronting fear. There's so many more, but the thing that's missing here is where is connection to the creator, to something greater than yourselves? I mean, if we had to define self-care versus spirituality, I think- Self-help. Yeah, sorry. If we were to define self-help, um, and spirituality, they would actually look very different. Self-help, I think, offers external guidance and practical techniques, which I think are very valuable, by the way, and very important and necessary. Um, but self, but spirituality beckons that you embark on an inward journey, connecting to something greater than yourself and exploring the depths of your soul, the potential of who you could become. For me, spirituality really is having such a connection, a sense of certainty connected to your source that you make sense of most challenging things that are happening in your life. Or not even make sense of them, but are able to receive them. And grow from them and learn from them. And if you're really doing it to the ultimate level, then you actually appreciate them. So I see self-help as offering very valuable tools to help a person practice spirituality and stay in check with it but spirituality must come first and of course there's different ways to connect to that but that's in essence absolutely and again so one of my favorite books regarding what i would call the spiritual the work and when i say the work i mean this internal spiritual work is a book by a great italian kabbalist his name is moshe chaim Lusato. and he writes that he begins with a statement <coughs> which I think is so important. He says, we came into this world to achieve great goodness. That's the singular purpose which we came into this world. But the only way to achieve that is by drawing closer to the source, as you said, or one can call it the Creator or the light of the Creator. That path from who I am right now to a greater and greater attachment to my source. That's what brings pleasure, that's what brings peace, that's what brings joy. But that path is not a path that is easy. And I, and I wrote down four elements, I think, that strongly differentiate. I mean, that's interesting you're saying, because it's, it's not easy. And I think that because it's not easy, and people don't find the importance or value in it necessarily, because it's not for survival, Right? We're not raised when we're young, like you need to be, I mean, we're raising our children like that, and we're, we're creating a community that's like that. But for most of the world, that's not part of the things that, you know, you need to learn how to put a roof over your head, you need to learn how to um, survive, maybe you need to learn how to be happy, right? We want our children to be happy. But this idea that this is the essence, right? This is how you attain all of those things is not how most of us grew up. Well, and I think that's so important, right? To understand that whenever we feel unease, and it can be we feel anxiety, we feel fear, we feel unhappy, we feel unhappy in our relationship, whatever that is, the root cause for all of those emotions, experiences of unease, is the fact that my soul is not happy. And my soul will only be happy 
to the degree that I am endeavoring to move it closer to its source, to get it closer to where it came from. And, and nothing else that we can do. And that's why, you know, I think a person, again, like you said before, I don't want to diminish the importance of so many of the books out there, teachings out there around They're tools. They're self-help. They're necessary. Important, yes. necessary, all said. But they cannot within them, by and within themselves, all of them together, unless there is this very important, deep soul process. Right, because I almost think Cannot though, bring us to, to, to the goal of, of, of happiness. If you don't go through that soul process, I mean, I know somebody who, every now and again, she's, she's into something new, in ter- under the self-care umbrella, right? Self-care or self-help? Sorry, self-help, I keep saying that, because for me, it's all kind of mixed, but self-help, um, which I think sometimes she's even called for spirituality, but it's only lasts for a few months, and then she goes to the next thing, and then it might be astrology, and it might be something else after that, it might be another thing, and the the line always after is, I'm working on myself, I'm changed, I'm a different person, which almost feels like I'm doing these things and can't you see that I'm different? It's like external. It's not really this internal, because it's it's harder, right? It's easier to kind of say, and I think they alluded to this in the article too, that for some, it's like to say, okay, I'm going to therapy. Clearly that shows that I am, I am working on myself. I'm a good person. And that may or may not be true, but it's certainly not enough because it's not, there's nothing for it to stick on to. Right, which reminds me, again, a quote from that, art, that same article, which I thought was, very much in, in line with, with my, my view as it relates to the spiritual work. This is a quote from um, uh, Michael Denzel Smith. And he says, he interviewed therapists who confirmed the idea that people are going to therapy without a goal broader than, quote unquote, working on themselves. And sometimes to show others that mm-hmm. they are working on themselves. This, they said, can sometimes make sessions slightly confusing and rudderless. It's and funny, that word this rudderless is a very strong, yeah. Would bring it up whenever she was getting negative feedback about something she was doing. It was kind of like, hey, leave me alone. Not, you don't have to take, she wasn't taking responsibility for anything because I'm a good person. I'm working on myself, right? Right. So I do see that sometimes. Um, but what you were saying about rudderless? Well, I think that's the point. I think without consistent deep spiritual work, all the other self help tools, be they good or great, will always lead to a rudderless life. And it'll always be, okay, so what's the next self-help book that I'm going to read? And I, so what I wanted to, to share, I, I, as I was thinking about this idea, there are four elements, because I think what, I, what I'd like our listeners to ask themselves is, is am I living, I'm assuming everybody listening to this podcast sees themselves in the realm of self-help, desire to, to, to listen to something, to read something, make self-improvement. Yeah. But what we're saying I mean, is we've that we've always said, for instance, Kabbalah is really hard because it requires change, transformation, growth consistently, no days off, no matter what. Exactly. That's a real, that's a different playing field. To Absolutely. Be honest. Whereas, again, I think it's so important you said this before, but that again, often when people look at self help, it's okay, what is bothering me right now? And how can I, how fix can it? I solve it? And how can so, I make myself feel better? Feeling better is not spirituality. Exactly. Exactly. Joy happiness, no matter what's happening, is. So, for, for, I guess, elements or ways to ask yourself the question, are these four elements part of my work? If they are, then there's a greater chance that I'm truly on the, the right path, or the spiritual path, the path that brings my soul back to its source. Is it consistent? Meaning, whether in the days you're feeling great, or the days you're feeling challenged, the work that we're taught, whatever it is that you choose to do, but what you see as your spiritual work, introspection, transformation, is it consistent? Because if it's not consistent, if it's just, oh, well, today I'm feeling pretty good, no reason for me to either study, read, Pray. do any work, whatever those words, or whatever those tools that one uses, then I go back to that word, your, that person's life will be rudderless because it, it has to be consistent. Whatever work you're doing has to be consistent on the good days and the bad days. The days you feel like doing it, the days you don't. Number two, it has to be uncomfortable. And again, this again, I think also when goes... When you say it has to be uncomfortable. Whatever it is that you choose to do. So, for example... <laughs> yeah, give us one. Let's say a person chooses that part of my spiritual work will be every day 
I do an action that goes outside of myself. I'm going to help somebody outside of myself. But the question, the next question has to be, is it comfortable? That's okay for sometimes. That cannot be the, the entirety of the work. Meaning, are you sharing in ways that are uncomfortable for you? Whether it's the time that you do them, so you don't feel like going doing them, out of your or the person. Zone. Exactly. It has to be uncomfortable. It has to be uncomfortable. And this is, this is a second test between whether my work, whatever it is that I am doing, is part of true work, as I would call it, or work that is fine, but is ultimately rudderless. Is it, am I consistently choosing to make myself uncomfortable? So, the example here would be, if a person is a billionaire giving a, a big check, even though it is very spiritual, it is going to help people, is not really transformative sharing? The harder thing for that person probably to, would be to go help prepare meals in a kitchen, or clean a bathroom, or whatever, right? That is against his nature, against his comfort zone. Um, Right. And both are acts of sharing, but I guess it is which one is more transformative for you, right? That you are going to grow from that experience. Exactly. Another example is study, spiritual study is an important part of this, whether it is a book that you read, or somebody you study with, a teacher. And so, there are days you are inspired to do that, and there are days you are not. The question is, on the days that you are not, are you, do you make yourself uncomfortable to do that? Mm-hmm. Again, simply because if you are not, then it is not part of the true path. It is not part of the, of the spiritual path that will lead you to your soul's ultimate purpose in this world. So, that is two. The first one? First one is consistent work. Mm-hmm. Second is uncomfortable work. Mm-hmm. The third, there, ha- there has to be an element of it that does not make sense to you. Meaning? What I would call beyond logic. Uh, I'll use an example. So, so let's say you're you're you know you're you're helping somebody, right? And they ask you for something. Makes sense for you to give it to them. Then they ask you for something else, which does make sense for you to give it to them. And again, I'm not saying that you always do this because you might be right. Your your mind, your logic might be right. I shouldn't give this to them. But are there elements of your work, of your spiritual life, that are beyond what is logical for you? So it would that be the same as having an openness to giving of yourself in in places or areas that doesn't really make sense? Is that what you're also, saying? Also, also, I'll give maybe a clearer example. There are people who are involved in the spiritual work, and they are open to hear feedback because they know I can't always see what's right or wrong with me. I need to be open, but they assign this is the person I will listen to, or this is the person I'm comfortable receiving feedback from, this is a person I am not. Well, how about every once in a while, you put your pos- yourself in a position where, you're, where you listen to, where you open yourself up to listen to somebody who does not make you comfortable. So, Who you least likely want to hear from. Right, right. Or least likely, but less likely, right? It does not have to be your worst enemy, but it might be somebody who does not always well, make depends you... depends how the stakes, how high you're... Right, but the yeah, point Yeah, but is, I hear you, yeah. So, so... The, the third question or the third uh, prerequisite for real work is does it involve actions, situations that are beyond what your logical mind would either allow you or or put you put you to do? That's three. And four related really to the previous two is do you do things when you don't want to do them? Do well, wasn't you... that the fault? that's all of them? Well, yeah, but it, right so, Consistent work when you don't want to do it, uncomfortable work when you don't want to do it, beyond logic when you don't want to do it. So, but the overriding question is, you know, which I think I might be the, a very clarifying question for people who are on the quote unquote self help path. Am I engaged in it when I want to, and I disengage when I don't? That will not be a path that leads to the life that you are meant to lead. Because ultimately, just to be clear, this is not about living a stoic life where I just do the things because I have to, right? Or I do not want to do them, but I am going to do them begrudgingly. No, no. Which All is of, a form of religiosity, really. Right. All of these are meant to lead us to the life that we that we're meant to have, which is a life of goodness, which is a life of pleasure, which is a life of great blessings. But the path has to include these four elements. Your work, however you define it, your study, however you define it, your actions, however you define them, have to be within the realm of these four elements, right? They have to be consistent, they have to be uncomfortable, they have to be beyond logic, and they have to be done when you don't want to do them. 
interesting, the way that I see it as I was hearing you read off the list is that to do all of those things that you just said, it is a consistent battle with your own ego because your ego is going to want to feel comfortable and sometimes lazy and be in the driver's seat. And I think that is the fundamental difference between self-help and spirituality because self-help doesn't necessarily require you to diminish the ego. It doesn't make you necessarily kind of push yourself through and giving from internal to external. It's easier kind of, if we're not careful, just to look at all the things externally that aren't really working for us, for us to change them, think better about them, think better about our experience, but not necessarily transform, because that only happens through breaking of the ego. Absolutely. And I think you touched upon another important idea, which, which is that we have to accept that the voices in our head are not always, what I would say, our soul voice, right? That the ego with which we are born, and it's important to understand, we are made up of light and darkness. And we need it. We, we need, are made up of, right. of, of a soul and, and what we would call the ego, or other words, the desire, the desire to receive the self alone. Which we need, by the way. I want to be clear Element about self. that. Elements, but it cannot be the ruler. And therefore, when the reason why we've said everything we've said, that, that you have to go against, because there is going to be, there's going to be that voice. And the, the, usually it's referred to as the stronger voice, the voice that, that will overpower the, the voice of the soul if it is not dealt with, if it is not both acknowledged and put, and, in, its place. And put in its place. So I have a friend who often uses the example of a dog, right? A dog is a great pet, right? But he has to be trained and he has to listen to you, right? He has to know his master, as, if that, as our friend would say. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> and this is the point. If you, if you understand, if you truly take in that there is this other voice within my head. And therefore, not every idea that, that I have is what's good for me. Not every thought that I have is good for me. That there has to be a battle. And unless I'm battling against that other voice, and that battle consists of everything we said before, I'm probably losing the battle. It's interesting, too, because when I've witnessed people dying or, um, or, or struggling with an illness, often the phrase that comes and that they share in their regret in their life is, you know, I wish that I had, I had not let, I had not had such a big ego, right? Because they see very clearly then how that got in the way of their joy and happiness. It's not even just make your ego smaller so you'll be a spiritual being. It's really so you'll be able to live a life of joy and happiness. Absolutely. It's the one thing that, because the ego is the thing that gets upset, right? Gets slighted, gets hurt. Um, doesn't like rejection. It's all those things that complicate our lives day to day. Absolutely, and 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 to that point, it's not, and it's not just so we it's spoke. Funny. Like, when my father, before he got sick, um, he did have a brain tumor, and he had surgery for that, and he came out of it was like an eight-hour surgery, and um, and I told part of the story before that I ended up staying because my mom was worried, but I didn't actually go into why she was worried. Because I, I was there for the surgery, and I was there for 24 hours, then I was going to fly. They had to stay there for three more days over the weekend. Um, but when we saw him post-op, we went in to, the, to his room, to the hospital room, and he's smiling, and he's happy, and I'm like, Dad, how are you feeling? And he's making like sense, pretty much. But of course, he's loopy. It was a crazy surgery, and, and he was on medication. And then he turns to us, he's like, you know, I have such a big ego, my ego is so big, and I look at my mom I'm like, I'm going to stay. Don't worry, I'm going to stay, because my father would have never said that electively. Um, but, yeah. But it's the thing that, like, you know, he was speaking truth, by the way, at that, at that moment. Absolutely beautiful. Well, I don't know it was beautiful, but it was... Well, no, it's it beautiful, was, beautiful you sharing it yeah. with us. But, but another part of this, which is really important, in why maintaining... The, the work, as we're referring to it, I would say the spiritual work, is because not only is there a voice in our own head, the ego, the desire to receive for the self alone, the selfishness, that, that is overpowering unless you're battling with it through the work. Also, the, 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 what I would call the consciousness of the world. You take the most amazing person, and once we understand that 
the consciousness of the world influences us. What people care about, what people worry about, what people put importance to, that influences us. And it's, so it's not just whether... So the, a man is not an island. And, not, and that means, not just in a physical sense, that, you know, that, that I, a person is influenced by the people he hangs out with, which is, of course, also true, but also I and you and every single one of us... Affect everybody else. Are affected, well, affect everybody else, yes, but also are affected by the consciousness, consciousness of the world. And the reality is that the outward consciousness or the outward, um, often the the... the expression of humanity is a selfish one. Makes you want to go live on an island, actually. (laughs) Yes. By the way, it's one of the reasons why it's important to spend time in nature, because you you take yourself out. One of the reasons it's important to, to, for instance, read from writings of of great souls, because you attach yourself... Well, more than you attach yourself to that thought. You attach Mm -hmm. yourself to that person. Mm -hmm. But while we're in this world, we are influenced by everything that everybody's thinking. So, unless we're battling, we're losing the battle, because our mind, unconsciously, is going to start thinking the way everybody else thinks. Ego, selfishness, whatever those, whatever those thoughts are, unhappiness, anxiety. And therefore, the, the battle of the spiritual work versus other, other forms of self-help is, the, is that it helps extract us from the, the, the reigning, often negative consciousness that exists in the world. And unless it's done, as we said, consistently, uncomfortably, beyond logic, when I don't want to do it, then we fall prey to the, to the consciousness of the world. So let's just pause for a sec, because you said the way to get out of that is to go into nature or read something One of the ways, yes. spiritual. So, and I'm just playing devil's advocate here, how is that different than self-help? Because for some people, um, meditating is, is a form. So you're saying these are... These are the tools you use. These are, to, yeah, these are, these are all to, by all of those are great tools. Reading a book, studying deep spiritual teachings, meditating, going into nature. All of them are are important uh, uh, tools to use, and many others that we're not even mentioning. But we need to understand the purpose of why we're using them. Exactly, and it has to be part of a regimen. It does have to be part of a regimen. You know, people don't like the people. Again, people would prefer to think, oh, yeah, I'll, self-help is self-help, so I'll just do it when I feel like it or when or there's something down. pressing or, exactly. It's not the, that, again, of course, there's no judgment. A person, anybody can do whatever they want, but ultimately to achieve the purpose for which our soul came into this world and to experience the beautiful life that we're meant to experience, the spiritual path is the only way. So, and related to that is is the understanding that, and this is, might be a little bit deep, and you let me know if, if it needs to be impacted more. Probably, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's a great um, uh, Kabbalist, his name is R- R- Moses Cordovero, he's from, uh, originally from Cordoba in Spain. And he wrote a book where he speaks about the attributes of the light of the Creator, and how man, each one of us, is meant to emulate them. So, when we talk about... Can you go over that list? It's too long for this like podcast. Like give us three? Yes. Um, but the reason why it's so important is, if you imagine that we're a piece of a puzzle, right? The, pu- the piece that I am needs to be able to fit back into, refer to it, the source, the creator. And ultimate pleasure is when I'm in my place. What is my place? When I am in that perfect connection with the, my source, with the light of the Creator. We come into this world to shape ourselves in a way that fits in to our source. We come into this world with ego, we come into this world with selfishness, and the spiritual work is to sort of sand down the sharp edges that don't fit into our source. And when I make that transformation, ultimately I perfectly fit where I'm meant to be, back with my source. But we fit that's before we came. Before we, the work that we come into this world to do is to, we're, we, we're born with the soul. The soul, yes, came there. But the other parts of us, our ego, our selfishness, which is of the, what we call of the body. Which is right? also from past incarnations. Past incarnations, right. sure. That's the work that we're meant to do. Its purpose is to allow us to then fit back with our source, which is the ultimate state of bliss. So if you understand that, so what that means is that as we, ex- as we exist now, and of course it's a progression, my work is how do I 
make myself fit more, be more like, basically, the light of the Creator. And that's the purpose of the spiritual work, that I, I make myself back into the form that fits with the light of the Creator. Well, that's why that list is important. Give us three. So, one example he gives is that, well, the simplest one is that the light of the Creator is always desiring good for others. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, I think is something it's so most basic, of us, so difficult. It's so difficult, right? I mean, think about I mean, who really? Right. That, that, but you, a, if you did, you'd have saint in front of your name. Exactly. Right? But the point is, the point is, <laughs> it's an aspiration. It's where we need to be going towards. Another, Even uh, those who harm you. Ultimately, yeah. I mean, and that's the second, the second one I was going to share. There's a concept that's referred to as, um, not only does, because you use the example, when a person behaves selfishly, and let's use an example, uh, an extreme example. A terrible person, right? Who's still alive. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? It means that person is living a life that completely opposes the light of the Creator, right? Nevertheless, the Creator says, I will sustain you. I will give you life, right? So, the, the ancient biblical phrase is, is, is the fact, pesha, which means that even against those that, towards those, who behave completely incongruent with the light of the Creator, the light of the Creator still supports. So, when we talk about our own enemies, right? So, imagine, in this case, one of the attributes of the light of the Creator is to support those who hate you, right? And again, this is a very far... Yeah, you're going to need to unpack that one. Well, because it's pretty simple and straightforward. I'm not saying that every, every one of us needs to be there right now, but it's the but ultimate... But why and today. how does the Creator support those who They're harm alive. others? Who gives them life? The fact that they're still alive. Exactly. They might have a really horrible life. It's possible, but they still are alive. My point is to be my point is, you know, is that we study the attributes of the light to the creator, a giving force, a loving force, a force that desires good for everybody. Yes, in extreme cases, a force that gives to those who oppose it. Simply the, the point is, which I don't but, want it but, yeah. to be lost, that 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 is our life's journey. To become, in the words of one of my earlier books, become like God or become like the Creator. There Why? Oh, Michael. Because then. Good, but, wait, everybody, <laughs> if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. Stop what you're doing right now. Pause. Order this book. Yep. <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing not a bad job. You're, you're, becoming Like God by Michael Berg. Very good. Thank you. The point being, <laughs> that is the only way we achieve ultimate fulfillment. And the path towards there, as we become more and more like that, as we, I don't know which word to use, sort of sand our, our rough edges out, that allows us to become more like the Creator, more like that force that, that is the source of all blessings and all life and all goodness and all love. And all the ultimate purpose of our journey in this world is to become 100% like that force. By the way, that is to your point, the importance of study, everybody really actually needs to know that list by heart, because if not, it's, how do you know where to go? How do you know what to do? How do you know what to choose in each moment? It's kind of like you're searching for a treasure and you're just going around aimlessly. You need a map. You need a map with, with, uh, this is point one. You you complete point one, you go to point two. Um, We need the list, Michael. Okay. I might really, I think it's, I think it's very necessary. Um, and and the other thing is, you know, this idea of I, I never liked actually, you know, you just, you just inspired me. So maybe at the next week or the week usual. after, yes, um, we actually go through and again, I think it's very maybe, important. Maybe we do two or three podcasts and go through maybe some of those, like three or four at a time, of those uh, attributes. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, and this idea of faking it till you make it, I never liked that as a phrase before. But the truth is. Um, yeah, fake it till you make it. I mean, even if it's very forced to do some of the things that we've discussed, put yourself out there. And there is a concept that faking it can actually build a strong connection to the creator. Zora says the energy of the words that come out of a person's mouth literally awakens the same type of energy from above. If a person speaks good things, even if he doesn't feel them, he awakens positive light from above. If a person speaks negatively, he awakes, he awakens negativity from above. So it's kind of like like attracts like, even if we're not 100% aligned with that. It's very hard to do good all the time. Fake it, try it, because it's just, you're gonna, it's a win-win. 
Yes. Because ultimately it will become your nature and your character, but also you'll receive more and more blessings. Absolutely. Do you want to leave our listeners with one thought? Was, was that, that, that was a good thought. thought. Sorry. Um, and I mean, again, I, I always say more and let me think. No, no, no. I, what, I, what I would say to our listeners is make sure, well, question, I would say question, whether your self-help path, I would, I would call more importantly that your spiritual path is in line with what you've shared today. Is it consistent? Is it challenging? Does it make you uncomfortable? Are you doing it in ways that are logical? And are you doing it when you don't want to? Is and also, self-help is not the same as self-actualization. Absolutely. And what we're talking about is, how does my soul, and therefore my experience of life, become its ultimate, ultimate version? Mm-hmm. So, I'd mm-hmm. like to share, actually, two letters. And by the way, I really want to thank everybody who sends in the letters. It really, it's one of the highlights of my week when I get to read all the letters, or some of the letters that, um, that our listeners sent. So, the first one is from Kristen. Hi, Monica and Michael. You all are great, and I enjoy listening to this podcast every week, multiple times with each it's episode. Not y- in all, fact. It's y'all. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> I... <laughs> I always make a significant connection and receive tremendous wisdom from you both. Recently, Monica was sharing a story about Lucille Ball. I would like Monica to know that I too would stay up late at night and watch the I Love Lucy shows on reruns. By the way, everybody, we got so many letters and everybody... It's a gift that keeps uh, on giving. Not only knew you know. I Love Lucy, they were surprised that you did not. Oh, I, I knew. I was saying, I knew. <laughs> okay. In fact, I enjoyed it so much, my best friend and I would have sleepovers and watch the show on her, on her collector's edition VHS, VHS tapes. You kids in the in our audience, ask your parents what that is. Oh my God. I don't know I why found, you make yourself sound so... I'm not. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I'm going to have to ask my parents. Oh. <laughs> I found her story of, of determination and resilience very powerful especially for her age and it, and it being in the 1950s. I also asked my kids who are teens if they knew Lucia Ball. <laughs> they said at first that they didn't. But when I asked them if they knew the show I Love Lucy, they absolutely knew what I was talking about. Absolutely. Every week I look forward to your podcast and all the knowledge, wisdom, love, and joy you share. I especially love the deep spiritual lessons Michael shares and then how Monica helps to make it practical. <laughs> Keep moving forward. Love and light, Kristen. Thank, Thank you, you Kristen, Kristen, for this. By the way, I stand corrected. I, no. I need to say, um, I uh, when we were talking about Betty Davis, you remember Betty Davis? Oh, I remember. Uh, it wasn't Sweet Baby Jane. That's a great um, bakery in California, <laughs> Los Angeles. <laughs> it's actually, the, the movie was Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. I'm so happy. You, I'm sure a lot of people well, were going to the bakery looking for a movie. You do, do. Maybe <laughs> they want to check it out. This is a great time to remind all of our (laughs) listeners to send your questions, comments, funny stories, corrections to Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life. Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life. We read all of your emails. We enjoy all of them. It inspires us. It inspires our listeners. Sometimes it causes laughter, which is also good. Continue to share this podcast with everybody you know. Write five-star reviews at Apple Podcasts and share it again as far and wide as you can. This might be part of your spiritual work, and we hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. You said you were going to read two. I was, but we're out of time. So you just lied. I did lie. I'm sorry, and I apologize for that, too. Stay spiritually hungry.